Did you ever think that one day you would be the chairman of the Joint Chiefs? It was beyond any possible level of aspiration. People said this man should be President of the United States. It had never occurred to me. Any regrets about not having run? Some people say it's a great job. <laughs> no? Prove it. <laughs> New National Security Advisor came in and he wanted you as his deputy. So I said, if it's that important, why doesn't the president call me? Hello, General Powell. This is Ronald Reagan. Yes, sir. <laughs> Would you fix your tie, please? Well, people wouldn't recognize me if my tie was fixed, but okay. <laughs> Just leave it this way. All right. I don't consider myself a journalist and nobody else would consider myself a journalist. I began to take on the life of being an interviewer, even though I have a day job of running a private equity firm. How do you define leadership? What is it that makes somebody tick? We're here today at City College, a place that you graduated from a number of years ago. Thank you, David. Why did you pick City College? I was accepted at CCNY and I was accepted at NYU. And the reason I went to CCNY is NYU was charging $750 a month or a year. I couldn't handle that, family didn't handle that. So I took CCNY because it was free and because it was easy to get to and I'd heard a lot about it. And you grew up in the Bronx? I was born in Harlem about a mile from here and I grew up in the South Bronx section of New York, the Hunts Point section. And your parents were immigrants from? Jamaica. Jamaica? Yep. So growing up uh, in New York, did you enjoy New York as a young boy? I thought it was a wonderful place to be a kid. It was such a diverse place that it, it, really, it really bonded on me that this is what the world is, full of people of different backgrounds, cultures, colors, you name it. And of course, CCNY uh, replicate that perfectly. I learned a little bit of Yiddish working for six years in a, another corner of the South Bronx, uh, at a place called J Sixers, which sold uh, juvenile furniture and carriages and toys. He was a Russian Jew. Uh, it was me, there was an Irish driver and an Italian uh, salesman in the store. And one story I love to tell is after I'd been doing this for a couple of years with Jay, he came up to me and he put his arm around my shoulder and he says, Kali, Kali, a Jewish Yiddish diminutive. Kali, Kali, don't think you can stay here at the store. This will go to my, 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 my daughters and to their, to their husbands. I want you to get your education and go somewhere and do something. And I had no intention of staying at that store and being uh, what's called a schlepper. Somebody just drags boxes around. It's your schlep. Everybody knows what schlep means. It touched me so deeply that I remembered it for the rest of my life and wrote about it in my memoir. He thought enough of me to tell me that I should get my education and move up. And that's what I did, and CCNY was the source of that education. Did you ever think that one day you would be the chairman of the Joint Chiefs and the Secretary of the State of the United States? No, people ask me about this all the time. It usually starts out with, what year did you graduate from West Point? And well, I didn't go to West Point. I couldn't, I couldn't have aspired to go to West Point. Well, did you go to the Citadel, or did you go to Texas A&M, or Virginia Military Institute? I says, no, they wouldn't let black guys in then. It was beyond any possible level of aspiration or expectation, but it happened. Why did it happen? Because I got a quality public school education that I didn't know was of that high quality at the time. Elementary school, junior high school, high school, and then CCNY let me in with my modest average. And it was ROTC in CCNY that really made the difference. Now you were a geology major. Did you think you were going to go into the geology world? Or? No, I was a geology major because I busted out of civil engineering, okay? Now you know. <laughs> <laughs> that didn't need to come up, David. Thank you very much. <laughs> when you graduated, you, uh, when you're in ROTC, you have an obligation to go into the military. You went to the South for training. I graduated in 58 and then went to Fort Benning, which was still in a segregated state in a segregated city, Columbus, Georgia. So I knew well that on post, I was like anybody else. But as soon as I left post, there were places I could not go, stores I could not go into, places I could ne never think of even ordering a hamburger. And I was thrown out of hamburger joints in Columbus, Georgia. They just would say, we don't serve you? It was even worse than that. I stopped at a little hamburger joint late one night, and I knew I couldn't go in. So I just went to the window and asked for a hamburger. And this nice white lady from New Jersey said, I'm sorry, I don't know why, but I can't serve you. You can go around the back. I said, no thanks. So I went back on to the base 
and uh, that was in early 1964. And then the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Accommodations Act, was signed in July, just before July 4th. And on July 5th, I went back to that hamburger joint, and they served me. And what what America discovered is that segregation was not just a burden for blacks. It was a burden for whites. We're living in a crazy system. You went to Vietnam, and you were injured? Yeah. And you came back to the States, and you went back again to Vietnam? About five years later, I went back and got injured again. Yeah. And when you came back, um, your career really took off a bit. You became a White House fellow. I did. I was one of about 15 people who would serve one year in Washington in one of the offices of the cabinet. In my case, I worked in the Office of Management and Budget, uh, and I learned a lot about government in that year. And after your White House fellowship, you did about, what? I went to Korea to command a battalion, an infantry battalion in Korea. Okay. It's a year that I've considered uh, one of the most rewarding years I've had in the Army. We were just starting out in the Volunteer Army, and it was my opportunity not only to train these young people, but to give them a GED education and English as a second language. You eventually went to Europe? I was in Europe as a young lieutenant for two years, and then the period you're talking about is I worked for Cap Weinberger. The Secretary of he Defense? He was the Secretary of Defense, and I was his military assistant, his senior military assistant. And we became exceptionally close. And after two years, it was time for me to move on and get back in the Army. And they got me an assignment in Germany where I was going to take command of a division. I was now a two-star general. And then one day, the chief of staff, General Wickham, walks in and says, uh, we, we've changed. I said, what have you changed? Sir, the family's packed. We got the house, the whole stuff, the stuff's moving. Mr. Weinberger wants you to stay here for another year. I said, and not take a division? And that's right. And then he said something which was quite right. He says, just remember, Colin, you're here to serve. And you serve where we need you. I can find division commanders anywhere. Mr. Weinberger, the Secretary of Defense, wants you to stay longer. Yes, sir. And then I went in that evening to see Mr. Weinberger, Secretary Weinberger, and he knew I was kind of disappointed. And so he looked at me and he said, well, you know, Colin, you're not going to get a division now, and I know that disappoints you. But next year, you're going to get a corps, and that's two divisions. Right. Corps is a much larger organization, 70,000 people in the Fifth Corps. And a year later, he let me go, and I went to Germany and took command of the Fifth United States Corps, headquartered in Frankfurt, guarding the Fulda Gap, one of the invasion right. routes we expected the Russians to come. So out. that was a great job. It was a great job. It lasted four months. Because what happened was there was the Iran-Contra scandal. Yep. New National Security Advisor Frank Carlucci came in, and he wanted you as his deputy. And I said, Frank, it can't be that important. He says, it is that important. So then I said, okay, see if you can risk your entire career by saying the next sentence. I said, well, Frank, if it's that important, why doesn't the president call me? <laughs> Half hour later. You had a call from? Hello, General Powell. This is Ronald Reagan. Yes, sir. <laughs> I really, really want you to come back here. He's reading, he's reading the talking points right. that Frank gave him. I really, really want you to come back here and be the deputy national security advisor. Yes, sir, I'll be right there. So you came back? Yeah. Nine months later, Frank got assigned to become the Secretary of Defense. And I'm saying, good, I can go back to the Army now. And then um, one day I was chairing a National Security Council meeting, and suddenly the door opens and the President walks in, gets to the head of the table, and Frank comes around to the side. And while the meeting is going on, Frank rips off a piece of paper, and scribbles something on it, and he sends it down the table to me. And I open up the little piece of paper, and it says, you're now the National Security Advisor. No interview, no nothing. And so the last year and a half of my time in the White House was with President Reagan. Became an extremely close and strong uh, relationship. When the administration ended, uh, you went back into a military position. But not that long afterwards, President George Herbert Walker Bush, President of the United States, right after Ronald Reagan said, I need you to be the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. I'm in Atlanta, Georgia, with a great command, a beautiful house, nice headquarters. And I'm at a conference in the Baltimore area with uh, all the Army senior four stars. And I get a call. Secretary Cheney, now the uh, new Secretary of Defense, wants to see you. And so I said, uh-oh. So I go to the Pentagon in chinos and a polo shirt and go into his office. And he says, uh, President Bush wants to make you the chairman. 
All of a sudden, when you were doing your book tour, people said, this man should be President of the United States. It had never occurred to me, and then suddenly the book came out and it, it caught media attention. Um, and lots of people were coming to me saying, you know, you need to run. Any regrets about not having run? No. Why? Well, some people say it's a great job. <laughs> no? Prove it. <laughs>
And so I was pleased to be able to go back into government and serve my country. Okay, so you're Secretary of State, and then 9-11 happens. When did you realize that you would have to be involved and the government have to be involved in some kind of military confrontation? Well, you can't let something like that go by without doing something about it. And my mm -hmm. job was to not immediately get involved in military matters, but to pull the international community together. And it was a very rewarding experience. And for the first time in NATO's history, they invoked what is called Article 5, which said if any member of the alliance is attacked, we are all attacked. So they were all on our side. Subsequently, we turned our attention to Iraq, and President Bush decided that we would do an invasion of Iraq to go after Saddam Hussein. What I said to the President uh, before that was, Mr. President, you need to understand that if you take out this government, you become responsible as the new government. You become responsible for 27 million Iraqis who will be standing there looking at us. You take on great responsibility and you sure you understand that and you want to do it. And we were private when we were having this conversation and he said, well, what's the alternative? I said, the alternative is to have the UN be in the first position. They're the ones who have violated, the resolutions have been violated. So let's have a diplomatic approach. President Bush said, I agree with your idea of going to the UN and convincing them. He did. Before taking military action, he wanted to present our case to the United Nations publicly. And so on a Thursday afternoon, I was in with him. He said, would you take the case next Tuesday? To the and UN. Yeah. You made the case that Saddam did have, or we thought he had, um, weapons of mass destruction. When it turned out he didn't, right. um, do you think you know, you were embarrassed by that? Or do you think that the U.S. was embarrassed? Or do you think, had we known he didn't have weapons of mass destruction, President Bush would have gone ahead anyway? No, he would not have gone ahead. And, and I asked him that specific question when we were going through this. I said, Mr. President, if Saddam Hussein can prove that he has no weapons of mass destruction, then you do not have a basis for war. Are you prepared to accept that, even if it means Saddam Hussein will stay in place? Hesitantly, he said, yes, I will accept that. So that's why I went forward. So I went out and spent three days at the CIA with the intelligence communities and prepared the document that I would present. And every word in there was, was approved by the CIA, was written by the CIA. And so we went, I gave the presentation. It seemed to go well. I was confident that it went well. But then within a few days or a couple of weeks, it started to fall apart. So yes, I was, I was more than embarrassed. I was, I was mortified because even though the president had used the same information, Congress had used the same information, Secretary Rumsfeld, Condoleezza Rice, all of us were using the same information, but I'm the one who made the biggest presentation of it. So it all sort of fell on me. That's, that's show business, huh? But today, in hindsight, would you say the invasion was a mistake? I'd say the execution of the, of the invasion was not done properly. We abandoned the army without any discussion back in Washington. And then we abandoned something worse, the Ba'ath Party, and said that anybody who worked for the Ba'ath Party could not work in the new government. Those were two monstrously bad strategic decisions. And we did not have enough force in there to do what we wanted the Iraq army to do. And the place fell apart. Now, right now, Iraq has a democracy. It's tricky, but it's a democracy. They have elections and they are trying to restore order in their country. If they do all of that, I think it's bad that we went about it in such a terrible way, my humble judgment, others will not agree with me, uh, that um, if they come out through this difficult process they're in now as a democracy, no weapons of mass destruction, no Saddam Hussein, then I think you'd have to judge this differently than what's being judged now. What is it in your view that makes a person a great leader? A person who understands that they are leading followers person who understands that they are there to put a group of human beings into work that has value, that has a purpose, and the leader will give them the inspiration needed to achieve that purpose, and the leader will make sure they have everything they need to get it done. President Bush is re-elected. Uh, in the second term, you retire as Secretary of State and do things in the private sector. One of the things you did was to set up the Colin Powell School at CCNY. Tell us about the Colin Powell School. 
When I left the State Department, I came up here to see a little center, the Colin Powell Center, that had been endowed by the Rudin family. And I wanted to see what they were doing. They'd been, you know, and the answer was they, they hadn't been doing much. Uh, it was more of a, a mini think tank. And I sat in the conference room uh, here at CCNY, and about a dozen students came in, and I saw incredible diversity among these 12 kids. And I saw passion in their eyes. I saw them hungry for a better life. I knew that most of them came from families where nobody had yet graduated from college. And this was the first generation of that family. And when it got back to me, I said, my God, this is me. This is me 50 years ago. I got to be a part of this. I know you're very proud of the school, as you should be. If you look back on your extraordinary life in public service, did your parents live to see your success? They were both saw me make colonel, uh, and they were very proud of that. But my father was failing, I could see that. And then he died about a year and a half later. So he didn't see me make general. But mother was there when I was promoted to general. And she stood there in this line of people, um, very proud. She was only about this tall, five foot three or so. And uh, there was a secretary of defense and the deputy secretary of defense and all these generals watching. And uh, so she was very proud. And she and my wife pinned my stars on. And from then on in, uh, in an almost Yiddish expression, she would say to everybody, my son, the general. You've seen many great leaders in your career, political leaders, military leaders, obviously you've been a great leader yourself. What is it, in your view, that makes a person a great leader? A person who understands that they are leading followers. A person who understands that they are there to put a group of human beings into work that has value, that has a purpose, and the leader will give them the inspiration needed to achieve that purpose, and the leader will make sure they have everything they need to get it done. So I've always taken on every job I've had. What am I trying to do? What's the purpose? What's the vision? What's the purpose? Why are we here? What are we doing? And then get that down to the lowest person in the organization, and then make sure they have whatever they need, whether it's uh, diplomatic weapons or real weapons of war, and make sure that I took care of them and gave them every opportunity to be successful. So that's what leadership is all about, inspiring followers. There's a story about Lincoln that I've always appreciated. In the early days of the Civil War, um, he would go to the old soldiers' home outside of the swampy area of Washington, up in the north part of the city. And there was a telegraph office there. And one night a message comes in, and the telegraph operator writes it down, and Mr. President, it's not good. And he hands it to him, and the message says, you know, the Confederates have just raided Link, a, a Union outpost out by Fairfax Station, and they've captured a, a hundred horses and a brigadier general. And uh, Lincoln says, oh, God, hate to lose a hundred horses. So the telegraph operator asked him, well, what, what about the brigadier general? And Lincoln's reply was, I can make a brigadier general in five minutes, but it's hard to replace a hundred horses. Somebody gave that to me the day I made brigadier general. <laughs> And it has been by my desk ever since. To this day, it's there. If you came to the house, now you'd see it. It always reminded me that your job, pal, is to take care of the horses. Don't worry about being a brigadier general. Take care of the horses, the soldiers, the employees, the clerks, the students, the faculty, whatever it takes to be successful in whatever it is you're trying to achieve.